Welcome everyone to today's seminar. My name's Lisa Carson, I'm the Branch Head of Community Safety. And before we get started today, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement. I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present and emerging. I would like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. Our topic of this week is the new seismic hazard map of PNG, Papua New Guinea, seismic, seismic tectonics, probabilistic ground motions and the building code presented by Hardy Gassemi, Phil Cummins and Mark Edwards. So this work is the culmination of work that began way back in 2014 with the creation of the first PNG seismic hazard model, followed by further work to inform a revi revision of the PNG building code. Hardy is a senior seismologist in the regional development section at GA. He received his PhD from the International Institute of Earth Engineering, uh, earthquake engineering in Iran in 2009. And prior to joining Geoscience Australia, he, ha he was a postdoctorate fellow at the Earthquake Reser Research Institute of the University of Toronto. Since joining GA, he has been involved in DFAT funded regional programs, covering a wide range of activities such as establishment of a new real time earthquake impact alerting in Indonesia, and development of the community-based earthquake monitoring network in PNG. Phil is engaged as both a senior research scientist at GA, where he applies his earthquake and tsunami science to GA's regional development section, and a professor at the Natural, Natural Hazards at ANU, where he combines research with teaching in natural hazards. He received his PhD in geophysics at the University of California, Berkeley, and worked as a postdoctorate and research fellow at ANU until 1980, 1996, sorry, Phil, where he moved to the Japan Center of Marine Earth Science and Technology, JAMSTEC. And after leading a geodynamics research unit at JAMSTEC in 2001, he took up a position in leading earthquake and tsunami research at GA. Mark Edwards is a director of vulnerability resilience and mitigation section. He leads a multidisciplinary team developing engineering, economics and social vulnerability models in the community safety branch. He is an engineer with 14 years of industry experience as a professional engineer, followed by 23 years of research with a scope that has widened from earthquake vulnerability to multi-hazard risk. He participated in the development of the Australian Building Code Standards for a range of hazards and he's led the collaborative development of a guidance document to enable the use of recently completed earthquake hazard assessment for PNG for building design. So please welcome Hardy, Phil and Mark, and I will hand over to Hardy. Hello everyone, and thanks Lisa for the introduction. So let me just turn off my webcam and just jump to the presentation. Uh, okay. Here we go. Yeah, so good morning. Uh, as Lisa mentioned in this presentation, my colleagues and myself, uh, we are going to present uh, the latest revision of the uh, Papua New Guinea's National Earthquake Hazard Assessment. And uh, as mentioned, uh, this work is uh, truly a team effort uh, uh, to basically deliver this project. And I would like uh, to start with acknowledging uh, my colleagues uh, at uh, Port Moresby Geophysical Observatory, as you can see them here, uh, for their full support over all these years. I would like to thank, uh, let me also try to have the pointer, here we go. I would like to thank uh, Deslon Lambang, uh, Martin Dole, uh, Chris McKee, Matthew Moyhoy, Norris Kisa, Marisa Igara, and Felix uh, Tarano. I would like also to thank uh, my colleague uh, uh, Graham Wetheril from uh, German uh, Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam and uh, our colleagues uh, from New Zealand, Andrew King and Rob Jury. And finally, all of my colleagues in Geoscience Australia who, who were working with me on this project, uh, Trevor Allen, 
uh, Phil Cummins, uh, Martin Hazelwood, and uh, Mark Edwards. I unfortunately I don't have time to go through all of uh, the contributions by each of the individuals, but I would just simply say that uh, it would have not been possible to deliver this project without the full support of uh, of these guys. So as a bit of the background and the motivation, uh, key motivations of this uh, project, uh, I think uh, they are all well reflected in this uh, panorama picture of the Port Moresby, which is the capital city of the Papua New Guinea. As you can see at the front of the picture, we have these uh, light wooden structure houses. And uh, in the background, we have uh, those high rise buildings and a few more uh, construction sites uh, for new buildings to appear in the capital city. And just looking at this uh, picture, uh, I just, uh, it just reminded me of this uh, cliche statement uh, that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. In other words, uh, people cannot be shaken to death by an earthquake, but uh, they can be, they can get killed if an uh, earthquake happens and a building uh, collapses. And in uh, Papua New Guinea, up until the late uh, 60s, most of the buildings, they were bush material type of structures. And as a result, so you can see one example here at the left side. And as a result of this, they were all, uh, they were uh, low in height and also light in weight. And these type of uh, structures are quite resistant uh, to earthquake uh, ground motions. But after 60s, buildings in PNG, uh, they have become heavier with the adoption of the new materials and the Western style architecture. And as you know, these type of structures are, uh, are quite vulnerable to the earthquake ground motions, especially if they have not uh, been designed following the building standards. And talking about the standards, such building standards are defined uh, usually in the building codes. And the uh, building codes uh, generally permit design forces to be calculated from what is called design spectrum. And uh, for any particular location, the design spectrum itself can be estimated or can be derived based on the estimated level of the ground motion at that particular location. And this is the part that we actually need to carry out the, the seismic hazard assessment. In other words, we, we perform the seismic hazard assessment to estimate the level of the ground motion. And then in combination with the design spectrum, we can uh, basically calculate or estimate uh, the required design forces uh, that we need to consider to design our buildings. So the current building code of the Papua New Guinea is no exception of this. So there is already a seismic zoning map attached to this uh, building code, which can be used uh, to basically estimate uh, the level of uh, the design ground motion at any location in Papua New Guinea. This uh, seismic zoning map, you can see it here, is developed uh, by Jury and others in 1982. And uh, it is clear that it divides the country into four seismic zones. And uh, within each uh, seismic zone, uh, the design level is, uh, is not changing or the design level within each zone is, is uniform, basically. So uh, surprisingly, this seismic zoning map has not been updated uh, for the past uh, the 32, 38 years actually. So, uh, we, but actually it is highly recommended uh, for the for the hazard assessments in the building codes, it is highly recommended for them to be revised every five years, if not less. And I think the, uh, it is quite clear that uh, why we need to, to do that. Because just take this uh, seismic zoning map as one example. Uh, this map definitely is a, a decent model uh, representing the, the hazard in Papua New Guinea. But it actually reflects our knowledge that was uh, available in 1980s. And uh, so as after 1980s, our knowledge naturally has been improved uh, quite significantly about the region, but uh, that knowledge is not captured here. And that's why I think we need to revise this uh, seismic zoning map. Just to give you one example, uh, uh, the, the previous, the existing uh, seismic zoning map of Papua New Guinea is uh, developed uh, mainly based on the distribution of the large earthquakes in the region and uh, for the period of 1900 to 1978, as you can see here. And for this study, we also compiled a comprehensive earthquake catalog 
which actually includes uh, more than 40,000 events and our catalog covers the period of 1900 to 2017. So it is quite clear by comparison of these two maps uh, that the, the amount of the data information that is available nowadays is not comparable with what, uh, what were available in, in 1980s. The earthquake catalog uh, that we compiled for this project uh, is called uh, we, is what we call a composite catalog. So it is based on merging three primary catalogs, and then um, we unified this composite catalog by adopting a hierarchical, hierarchical approach uh, to basically select our preferred earthquake origin and magnitude. And then we also developed the magnitude conversion equations and applied them to homogenize our catalog uh, into a uniform moment magnitude scale. And after that, uh, we also uh, removed the four shocks and main shocks uh, from the catalog uh, in order to uh, estimate the earthquake recurrence of the main shocks of the region and develop the magnitude of completeness models based on our catalog too. Unfortunately, I do not have time to go through any of these details about the catalog and the processing steps that were involved. But if you are interested in, please feel free to ask me questions or I can refer you to our paper that is accepted for publication in Bulletin of Earthquake Engineering. And, uh, to revise the seismic zoning map of the of the PNG's building code, we followed the, the classical probabilistic approach uh, to basically reassess the level of seismic hazard in Papua New Guinea. And in this approach, uh, the PSHA, we first need to basically identify all the potential earthquake sources in the region and also model each source in terms of uh, the activity. And uh, Okay, so on this note, I will pass to my colleague Phil Cummins to basically talk about the source modeling process that we followed. Phil, can you hear me? Okay, yep. Yep, good. Okay, I'll Let share my screen. Let me just uh, turn off my screen. Uh, yep, see. all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, just give me a second. Just a second. Window. That's the one. Okay, here we go. Share. Yeah. Okay, can you see that? I'm assuming that everyone can see that. Um, and uh, I wanted to digress for a few minutes, my first few minutes, to talk about how this project uh, led me to appreciate the deep uh, way that. Uh, PNG is embedded in the DNA of our organization because I had to sort of review some of the geologic literature on PNG and try to go back to some of the early literature. Some One of the best early references is by a guy named Duncan Dow, published as a BMR bulletin in 1977. And I was really, uh, you know, just reading the beginning of it really made me, uh, made a deep impression on me. And I dug a little bit deeper to learn that um, D Dow, Duncan Dow uh, was appointed by Dr. Norman Fisher, the guy uh, known as Doc Fisher, the same guy who our library is named after. Um, in 1958, he was appointed by uh, Fisher to become the resident geologist of the Australian and Minister UN mandated territory of New Guinea. And he was uh, originally a Kiwi, he is a Kiwi and, uh, and um, had uh, some experience, had some knowledge of PNG. And so he basically jumped at the chance to, to do this and spent the next 20 years or so uh, studying uh, the geology of PNG. And he, and this reference that I first started looking at, he describes PNG in the 1960s as one of the least explored countries in the world. And, uh, and then this report describes how he then explored it, uh, being, you know, part of GA, he explored this. Now I came here in 2001, um, I knew that uh, a lot of the old timers at that time had some experience with PNG, but didn't really realize, you know, the extent of the, well, just, you know, the involvement there. And, um, and, and, you know, like many of you, I do most of my work on a desktop. And so my biggest adventure has been uh, probably the upgrade to Windows 10, uh, you know, but Dow and his colleagues had some somewhat higher bar 
for adventure. And so when they had to go out into this unexplored, ter largely unexplored territory in PNG, uh, they did some remarkable things. And so this is one figure from his um, his memoir, which was in that that figure I that that thing in my last slide. Uh, PNG Hazards is the memoir that he wrote, and it's in our our library. This is an example of where they were able to actually use roads, but of course had to cross this interesting bridge, which I, I describe as a fine example of earthquake resilient construction in the 1960s in PNG. Um, they did many other things, though. They used, uh, they did, uh, they explored the Sepik River with a jet boat, which at the time in the 1960s was new technology. People didn't use jet, mo jet boats very much back then, nor did they go on the Sepik River, the Sepik River very much then. Uh, so it was a more remarkable uh, journey. Uh, and and you know, the, they did things like uh, have first contact. This was an example of. Um, uh, in the, uh, uh, the Bomali River Basin, where they had first contact with the tribe. Those are the guys in the upper left in that, that figure there. Um, these guys uh, showed up when they were doing their survey. They had absolutely nothing from the modern world, not even any metal. They didn't even have any steel axes or any of the basic, uh, any kind of metal implements. And, and their, their guides, their Papuan guides, could not communicate with these. This was, so they're you know, it's a and it's assumption that it was a, the first contact of these guys with uh, with Westerners, people from the modern world. They also uh, used the Bell helicopter, which might not see, seem a big deal nowadays, but in the 1960s, this helicopter had just been developed. So it was a very new technology back then, and they were using this thing to fly all over the place. And here you can see that helicopter is sitting on a bush landing pad that has been constructed um, quickly, an area that the very rugged terrain where there was simply no flat area for the helicopter to set down. So they had a, they, it was just a, a remarkable adventure to read about this. If you look at his memoir, the first few pages describe an instant incident with a helicopter that comes out right out of, seems to come right out of James Bond. Uh, so I highly recommend if you have time to, to, to learn a bit more about GA's er, early involvement with PNG. But it made me appreciate that this project was a continuation of a very long relationship, not only of GA working in PNG, but of GA staff working with Papuans. Duncan Dow speaks very highly of the Papuans he worked with. At the time, they didn't have any scientific training, but were very intelligent, industrious, and very, very helpful and supportive of him. Since then, of course, since independence, uh, there are now Papuans with scientific expertise, and we very much enjoy working with our colleagues there uh, and have found it a very positive experience. Okay, so let me get on to the science. This um, illustrates what we have to do. We have to characterize the type of earthquakes that occur in Papua New Guinea. It's a very uh, a complex tectonic area, as I'll describe in some, some detail. But I want to, 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 to uh, describe how we classify the events in terms of shallow crustal events. Uh, that you can see here that, that, that occur in the interior of the plate at shallow depth. Subduction interface events, so these happen on the boundary between the subduct, a subducting plate and the shallow crust, and then slab events which occur sort of deep within the slab. I'll spend by far, I'll describe each of these, but I'll spend by far the most amount of time on the major shallow crustal events and subduction interface events because that requires development of a seismotectonic model. But I'll start with the uh, the shallow distributed seismicity. So for earthquakes, moderate earthquakes, uh, less than 6.5, we describe these as distributed seismicity, meaning that they can occur, we allow them to occur basically anywhere in PNG. Uh, but we give them a um, probability of occurrence that is determined by the earthquake catalog that Hadi mentioned. We analyze that catalog and, and determine um, the probabilistic occurrence of earthquakes, including how that varies with magnitude according to what's called the Gutenberg-Richter relationship here, which describes the, the change with the frequency of occurrence of earthquakes as a function of magnitude. And so you can see it has two parameters, A and B. Uh, B describes the relative proportion of small versus large earthquakes, and A describes the, the overall level of earthquake activity. And we find, uh, as is uh, uh, not uncommon, that B does not vary significantly for the shallow uh, seismicity across the region. So we, f we fix B at 1.023, which is a typical value that B has. Uh, and then we've allowed the, uh, the absolute level of activity to vary spatially. So we established 
uh, a sort of grid on which we allow A to vary according to this figure you see in the lower right, and we allow the earthquakes to occur uh, and with a probability in proportionate to the to the a value and it and and in particular their magnitude the the probability of the occurrence of, of an earthquake of given magnitude varies according to the gutenberg richter relationship uh, let me see so this this involved uh over 26000 uh grids grid points at which we allow earthquakes to occur and these ruptures can grow so they'll occur at a particular grid point but they'll grow according to the magnitude and they will be limited by seismogenic depths at of course the surface and then 50 kilometers depth uh and the mechanisms vary spatially according to a previous uh uh study that that was done uh in 2016 uh, now, to look at the larger faults, though, in the subduction interfaces really requires a lot more study of the tectonics of PNG. And, and you know, we start off, we, we should start off by sort of setting this in context and trying to understand the history of the development of the, the current uh, uh, tectonic framework. And that, of course, began with the northward movement of Australia. And when it separated from Antarctica, this northward movement was first accommodated by subduction of oceanic lithosphere to the north of the Australian continent. And so there were there were subduction zones that sort of uh, developed to, to the north in the ocean. And then as, it, as Australia plowed farther and farther north uh, over the last uh, 50 million years or so, it has plowed over these subduction zones. So you can see what it looked like at 50 million years ago. There's this nice clean, this is along this, shows temperature along a profile here and you can see this cool slab subducting it's a very simple picture but as the australian continent plowed northward it basically plowed over several of these subduction zones so now it's this complicated uh, uh, image we have here where there are not only a, several different slabs at depth as we'll see but also these island arcs and these subducting subduction zone terrains have been have been accreted to the north of the australian continent and so uh, to study that, to try to understand then how things are moving around and, 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 and how they're sort of uh, arranged, uh, we need to use GPS uh, data. And so uh, we'll use GPS observations that have been conducted over several decades in PNG. This is, has involved a number of organizations, including GA and its earlier, uh, Oz, I think it was called OSLIG, the earlier geospatial organization. Uh, it's involved ANU, it's involved uh, GNS in New Zealand, um, and it's involved, uh, I think it's called Unitech, the University in Leigh, I believe it's called Unitech, and other, other uh, institutions in PNG. And so, I'll, you know, this, this data set of GPS observations has been built up over the years, and there, I, we were fortunate enough to be able to use two recent studies, one by Kalali et al. in 2015, and one by Wallace et al. in 2014, to study both the western and eastern parts of, of uh, PNG. I'll point out that Kalali et al., uh, Kalali, uh, uh, Ashraf Kalali was actually funded by an ARC linkage project for which AusAid was a partner. So, uh, so that was uh, that part of it was supported by uh, by DFAT, as, as as is this study. Um, so, uh, what they what is done now uh, when these GPS studies and what we want to make use of is a seismic, a basically a tectonic block model for the region. So here you can see in this very complicated figure in the upper right, you can see that tectonic block model. This is the Australian plate down here, very large plate. The Pacific plate is up here, and the Caroline plate is over here. And you can see the, re the absolute movement of these plates are indicated by these arrows. And you can see that in between these plates, there's a lot of micro plates. So this is, a, this is the tectonic block model consisting of, I don't even know, there might be eight or so micro plates in there. Uh, and, and oftentimes these vary depending on which study you use, these vary. We've largely followed uh, Kalali et al. In, in our tectonic block model, and um, this involves 14 major faults, several megathrust faults, and um, and uh, and and we really what we really need to rely on the GP, on the GPS for is for the slip rates and and in some cases locking on these active faults. So we need to know to know how fast these microblocks are moving with respect to each other and what direction they're moving in. Um, the slab, as I'll discuss later, the, the geometry of the interfaces, that is, is based on the slab 2.0 model developed by Hayes et al., uh, which is uh, part of a USGS study.
And so the idea is that these major faults, the distributed seismicity that I just discussed, will account for earthquakes less than magnitude 6.5, but we want to be able to ascribe earthquakes 6.5 and greater to major faults, which are going to uh, be on these uh, active plate boundaries. Um, and that's because that's because you know the smaller earthquakes, 6.5 and below, are relatively small. You can see this is 200 kilometers length. That's an idealized uh, earthquake rupture, and you can see those are relatively small ruptures that for which you know there might not be a surface expression, or even if there were a surface expression, it might be quite small and not not easily recognizable, whereas a really large earthquake typically will have a surface rupture and will have some surface expression and therefore be expressed as a mapped fault. So we expect the larger earthquakes, we hope that at least, that larger earthquakes will occur on mapped faults and that's and that's what we see here. And in fact, in this figure, it's the blue uh, curves here that are the uh, major faults we're going to consider. Let me see. I think that's, yeah. So here's another. Uh, this is the same figure. So it's the blue faults that we're going to consider as part of our seismic hazard model. The red ones are generally offshore, and I do not consider those as part of our seismic. Well, I consider them as part of the seismic tectonic model, but they're not actually uh, considered as earthquake sources because we don't think they contribute to the hazard. Notable features of this model, uh, you know, there, there are a number of models like the very similar to this that have appeared in, in various bits of literature in the past. Uh, I wanted to put up, point, indicate some notable features of this. One is that it's got, there, there's this Moore's, Moore's B trough down here, which is also called or merges into what's called the Pocklington trough. And, and we regard that as inactive, which I think is not, uh, I think agrees with most of the public, published literature. It was actually Kalali et al. that claimed uh, to detect some active convergence on the Moresby trough, but in a personal communication, he told me that he was not very confident in that result at all. So we've left that as inactive, and that's consistent with most, most studies. We have put in what I call a nominally active Trobrian trough. That is controversial and probably does not agree with, mu with much of the published literature. I did that because of a study by uh, Letts, McHugh, and Ripper, in which they, they, uh, they analyzed a, an historical earthquake uh, that appears to have been, at least I, I think it's consistent with a large thrust event on the Trobrian trough. So I wanted to leave just a, a small amount of convergence on that. I used one centimeter per year, which is small for, for PNG, uh, just to show that it can have earthquakes, but it's really got a very minor contribution to the, to the earthquake hazard on, on the main one, at least. And then I've also um, allowed for this new bar of fault here that you see in red to extend beyond the Trobrian trough and, and then cut off what's called, what I call the Trobrian block. And that's, that's um, follows some work by a guy named Goodliff at uh, yeah, University of Alabama and one of his students, I think the guy's name was Cameron, and uh, and they they based on their analysis of bathymetry, they think that that there is still activity in the Trobrian trough, and that the new Burr fault has this extension. That is very uh, speculative, but you know, and it doesn't really contribute to the hazards. So it's not a very big deal. I do want to point out now that that a number of these boundaries are quite poorly determined, um, and. And, uh, you know, there's just not much data on things like the, the actual trace. Everyone agrees that there's probably activity on this Buwami Torricelli fault, but, but I couldn't find any detailed trace for that fault. So it's essentially a line that follows the, the mountain range there. Uh, similarly, this, this one here, there's very little seismic activity on it. But you know the others might have data, in fact, and in fact, it might be oversimplified. So there's, you know, this is really uh, a first seismic tectonic model to base our seismic hazard map on. And it's, it is uh, simplified and there are features in it that are not particularly well determined. There's lots of work that needs to be done on this. Uh, so I want to go over a, just a few of these in, de in some detail. So this shows the Western part of the seismic tectonic model. I wanted to show to indicate that there were a couple of places like this Bismarck Sea seismic lineament and the RA uh, fold and thrust belt for which they're really, we really, you re it's very difficult to identify a single fault that's responsible for all the earthquakes. And so we left that as distributed seismicity, which means we actually allow the distributed seismicity to grow past magnitude 6.5 in those particular places. Elsewhere, we think we are able to, to describe 
all of the historical earthquakes. These are these are these yellow ones are from our historical events, which are not recorded. The blue are from the ISG gem catalog, which are recorded. And we think that there's a reasonable argument that all of these can be ascribed to the major faults that we indicate here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as I indicated, the some of these are, however, quite poorly defined. Um, and uh, I also wanted to point out that the New Guinea Trench. Um, We've we've said that it's you know that's been a little bit controversial whether that's active. I think most people now would agree that it's active, uh, and we've allowed it to have very large earthquakes on it because it is a, a long subduction zone which potentially could host a very large earthquake. But it's got a, a and it's got a pretty fast convergence rate. But Kalali et al. find that it's got very low coupling, so it's very these large earthquakes would be very infrequent, which might explain their absence from the uh, recorded earthquakes. I want to just talk about a couple of these faults. One of the most important is the Ramu Markham fault, which is a remarkable fault. It's one of the uh, most hazardous faults, I would say, or or it leads to the highest risk probably in our in our seismic hazard map. Um, and it has a it, it's got this. Um, it's due to this collision. I talked about the arc collisions. This is one of the arcs that's been colliding and being accreted to the northern part of the Australian uh, continent. And um, and so there's shortening here and there's a big thrust fault going down the Ramu Markham Valley. But it's not just a, it has a particular character that is almost unique. I don't know anywhere else in the world where you get this, that it's got this, this ramp, this relatively steeply dipping thrust ramp, which then soles out into a mid-crustal decolement, which uh, in and of itself is not that remarkable, but what is remarkable is that this this uh, detachment, this shallow dipping detachment, is seismically active. Elsewhere in the world, you can you have that configuration, but usually that deeper uh, detachment is not seismically active. Here it is, and and in fact, it appears that it might be capable of supporting very large earthquakes. Certainly, there are earthquakes of magnitude eight. There's a there's an earthquake in the catalog of magnitude eight, and and some other very large earthquakes in this catalog that appear consistent with this shallow dipping decolement. Um, I did want to mention, uh, and so that's what we've we've ascribed them to. I did want to mention that though, on the other side of the Suam Peninsula, there's this spectacular and very famous series of raised marine terraces, at least some of which are, um, are, are thought to be generated by earthquakes in the Holocene. And it's difficult for me to imagine that those uh, could be associated with anything other than some other thrust fault that would be north verging. So there might, there, there could very well be uh, uh, thrust faults and perhaps major thrust faults that that we still don't know about. They could be blind thrusts on the other side of the range. But but in any case, for the because we don't know have any data on that, we've just used this uh, this steep ramp with the shallow detachment to describe the Ramu Markham fault. Um, I also wanted to point out the Southern Highlands thrust fault, which is I, I call it, which is really a fold and thrust belt. And clearly, you know, this is an oversimplification to make it a, a one single massive thrust fault, but it is capable, as we discovered in 2018, of hosting a magnitude 7.5 earthquake. And this, it's a re quite remarkable that the INSAR analysis of that earthquake shows a surface ground motion that aligns really well with this pronounced bend in the fault. So that, you know, indicates that, yeah, maybe there is a single fault that does pass through this fold and thrust belt. Um, however, uh, that is, you know, controversial. This is a study. I think I think this is a this was a student's thesis in uh, the U.S. in which uh, they ascribed this uh, this same pattern of surface deformation to a relatively complicated um, sort of multiple faults that that sole out into the into a more shallow dipping fault down here. So uh, so you know we this is likely to be an oversimplification, but just how much of an oversimplification we don't really know yet. Um, okay, uh, let me move on then to East Papua New Guinea, um, where again, I'll point out that we've, we've had the Trobian Trough is active. This is that 1895 historical earthquake, which I think, you know, sounds like it was a major thrust earthquake on that. We've given it just a very small and sort of arbitrary slip rate of one centimeter per year. We've got this, again, this Nubara fault, which extends. This is again, speculative that it might extend and sort of uh, section off the, this trobrian block. Um, I've already mentioned Moresby, uh, uh, Moresby Pocklington trough. Um, and also the New Britain Trench is split into west and east. Now I want to go on a little bit farther and talk about some of the other remarkable features of this. One is this Owen Stanley fault, which I've I've just lumped the Owen Stanley, which is really this part of the fault, with the 
my, I can't say it, the my good enough fault uh, over here, I, I, because it's not clear where, you know, the boundary, if, if there is a distinct boundary between them, I, I couldn't really discern it in the literature. This is remarkable because this, uh, at least Kalali, he, he, he considered all these as one block. He solves for the rotate, the movement of that block, and you get a rotation pole here, which is right next to the plate. It means it is, it is moving in this very tight circle here. And so the remarkable uh, thing about that means that, that along this fault, you're getting normal uh, mechanisms here, normal faulting earthquakes here, which transition into strike slip along here and then into thrust over here. So that's really a remarkable change, not only in slip rate, but also in, in actual uh, faulting regime. So I don't know, again, I don't know where else in the world you get that. And it was difficult to actually use that with the seismic hazard software that we uh, that we use, um, the OpenQuake. And uh, this is, um, yeah, this does show a, a study by Abers in 2001, which shows these normal faulting earthquakes here, and also shows it's remarkable as you get farther out here, sort of into the wood part lug basin, which again, or towards the word lug basin, which is, this is again an oversimplification. It's actually more complicated than that. You get these really low angle normal faults, which are quite unusual and are not, they're, they're quite controversial because they really shouldn't be active at those very low dip angles. But this one clearly is, it's about, it's between 10 and 25 degrees dip, much lower dip than the 60 degrees, which is the optimum, optimum dip for a normal fault. And there's also this very interesting study by Weber et al, which shows, uh, that's done on the online portion of this and shows that in fact as those faults get shallow you can get these more steeply dipping faults that sort of start to become active so as this fault becomes really shallow it's sort of this part of it sort of the activity here cuts off and it switches to this more steeply dipping fault and that's why we don't we don't see there's this strange embayment that this my good enough fault has but that's been cut off by a different fault which is now the active strand uh, okay, and then finally, I wanted to talk about the Wheaton Fault, also in eastern Indonesia. That's way over here in New Ireland. It's a strike slip fault. It's a major strike slip fault. And, you know, I just calculated from Kalali's tectonic block model what the slip rate on that is. And it's it's like 140 millimeters per year. And I believe that is by far the fastest slipping strike slip fault in the world. So I just put on here some other strike slip faults that I know of. The Queen Charlotte Fault is is known as a very fast slipping uh, strikes up fault, 50 to 57 millimeters a year. Palo Coro, again, in Indonesia, a, a fast fault. And these are some other major strikes up faults. And you can see that their slip rates are far, far lower than the Wheaton fault. Uh, but, you know, by a lot. And and although the Wheaton Fault itself is an oversimplification, there's also this another Sapum Fault to the south, which is thought to be active. Um, it, you could you could split this slip rate between them, and they would still both be the fastest slipping fault, much faster than these other strikes up faults. Um, this this also experienced a very large earthquake quite recently. I think it was just last year, which caused 0.8 g acceleration in Kokopo. So it's very it is actually quite important, although it appears quite remote. It is actually very important for the seismic hazard. And then finally, I oh I'm running out of time. I finally uh, want to just quickly mention the interest lab se seismicity. This was accounted for by using a very innovative technique developed by our colleague Graham Weatherill, in which we use the slab two model from Hayes et al. We took we look at the earthquakes, that's the, the slab interface. We look at all the earthquakes that are occurring below that to get our activity rates and assign it uh, to uh, a grid that we establish within that slab. And, and the innovative thing about it is we can then uh, allow the earthquakes to grow but not allow them to penetrate beyond the slab boundary, which is very important in avoiding overestimation of the hazard. So uh, with that, I want to end. I'm sorry I went a little over time, and I will hand over to um, to Mark Edwards. Let me uh, let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, I think you should hand it over to me. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah. I'll stop sharing, so and I'll shut up. Uh, okay. Cool. Let me just. Okay. So. All right, so everybody can see my screen now. Okay, let's assume yes. Okay. Yep. So 
after the first step, which was the basically modeling all of the potential seismic sources in the region, the next step in PSHA study is to estimate the level of the earthquake ground motions that can be generated by those earthquakes that are occurring at our modeled seismic sources. And for doing that, uh, generally we are using uh, what we call empirical ground motion models. So these models are simple or complex uh, mathematical models that basically relates uh, your ground motion parameter of interest. So let's say, for example, peak ground acceleration to other explanatory parameters uh, related to the earthquake source, such as in this simple case, earthquake magnitude, and also other parameters representing the propagation path of the seismic waves. In this case, it's modeled by the by the source to site distance and uh, parameters representing the the local site conditions so which can be a binary site class or it can be a, like a continuous parameter such as the shear wave velocity as an indicator for the uh, local site condition so when we are carrying out the psha for the for the region the preference would be to basically use region specific ground motion models and uh, such uh, to develop such region specific models then it means that we need to have a uh, enough number of recorded data to develop those models in uh, Papua New Guinea uh, Port Moresby Geophysical Observatory since uh, 2013 is running a, a, a national seismic network that uh, includes uh, 10 seismic stations which are shown by uh, these let me sh by these uh, blue triangles and the white squares are uh, the broadband stations that are uh, maintained by by geoscience australia so as you can see uh, from this picture the number of the stations that are actually operating at the moment in papua new guinea is not unfortunately dense enough and we haven't uh, recorded enough number of records uh, to basically use those records to First of all, check the performance of existing ground motion models and uh, also even uh, to try to develop a new PNG specific model. So we are still a bit uh, behind uh, that. And for the purpose of this study, we actually looked at the literature and uh, used uh, and selected a few ground motion models that, that are developed uh, for it for regions with the similar tectonic settings as Papua New Guinea. As Phil mentioned, uh, we have uh, three general classes within our source model, active shallow cross, subduction interface, and subduction in a slab. And for each category, there are a range of uh, uh, ground motion models that you can look in the literature and choose from. So for example, this model that we choose here, the Zhao 2016 is the one that is developed for Japan. It has three versions. One is based on the active shallow crustal data in Japan. The other ones are from the subduction events in Japan. And uh, after selecting a few ground motion models, we basically put them in a framework of a logic tree to somehow capture uh, the uncertainty there. And I should also mention that after building up the, the source model and the ground motion model, we use the OpenQuake engine uh, to run the calculations. And we also uh, use the national uh, computation infrastructure, NCI, to run the PNG model. So the, the final step in PSHA, which is done by the machine itself, uh, is that basically combining uh, all the modeled earthquake sources, the ground motion models, and all the uncertainties that are associated uh, with those models to basically derive uh, the expected level of ground motion. And uh, the key product here is uh, what is called the seismic hazard curve. Uh, one example of uh, such curve is shown here this is actually the calculated seismic hazard care for Port Moresby. Here, the y-axis is uh, indicating the probability or chance of exceedance in in the in 50 years, and the x-axis is uh, uh, the peak ground acceleration, your ground motion parameter of interest in in this case, peak ground acceleration in terms of g. So, using such uh, hazard curves, we can basically uh, quickly estimate the expected level for any written period. For example, if we are after the peak ground acceleration value with 10% uh, chance of exceedance in 50 years, we can uh, directly read that value from here. So we find the 10% on y-axis, and then we can read the corresponding value from the x-axis. And for Port Moresby, that value 
is with 0.16 G. And if, as I said, you can go to the other written period. So for example, if you're after 2% uh, chance of exceedance in 50 years, which is roughly 2,475 years written period, we can again uh, read it uh, from our hazard curve, which in case of Port Moresby, that would be close to 0.3 G. There are also many other products that we can basically extract from our, uh, from our hazard model for the region. And as I said, uh, using, the hazard, uh, using the hazard curve, we can basically estimate the expected level of ground motion for, the, for whatever ground motion parameter of interest that we have. This is the hazard curve that we calculated for lay. And if we calculate the 10% in 50 years, the number would be close to 0.8 G. We can also uh, change the ground motion parameter of interest to other units, for example, the spectral acceleration at the period of 0.5 second and spectral action one second and just uh, keep doing this to basically cover a range of uh, ground motion parameters of interest. And then we can connect all of these points uh, together to derive what is called the uniform hazard spectrum. So you can see that every single point on your uniform hazard spectrum has a same return period as all other points. And some people like a uniform hazard spectrum uh, and some people basically use it as a design spectrum, which has its own advantages and disadvantages. And the other product that we can derive from the hazard curve is that basically we can uh, calculate the hazard curve for a grid of site, which is shown here by the triangles here. We can, for each of these triangles, we can calculate the, the hazard curve. And from the hazard curve, we can calculate, we can estimate the expected uh, ground motion parameter of interest. So let's say in this case, peak ground acceleration for a written period of interest. And then we can contour those values to come up with what we call the hazard maps. So this is just one example of the uh, peak ground acceleration uh, map for 10% uh, chance of exceedance in 50 years or 475 years written period. So you can clearly see that the, the, the hazard value is actually reaching its highest values along the New Britain Trench and also along the RMF zone, which is somehow expected as uh, Phil was explaining. This is one other, uh, another example. So here we map the spectral acceleration and one second, but again, the written period is 10% in 50 years. The other uh, useful product of the built uh, hazard model is actually it can be helpful in guiding us to, to select earthquake scenarios through the disaggregation analysis. I have uh, many examples uh, to go through, but uh, for the sake of time, I will just uh, show you one example. So we did uh, carry out the disaggregation analysis for, uh, for a city called Bululo, as you can see it here. And actually this, uh, just recently, this city was uh, quite a bit shaken by an earthquake which occurred in 2019 with a magnitude of 7.1 and depth of uh, 146 uh, kilometer. And the earthquake itself was uh, located 33 kilometers northwest of Bululo. I should uh, mention that this event was not part of our catalog. So, so, and then we carried out the disaggregation analysis for Bululo, basically just to study which sources are contributing to the to the hazard in Bululo. And if you carry out the disaggregation, so this is uh, just showing you the, the, the regional based uh, disaggregation. Your X axis is basically in, uh, indicating your tectonic regime and your, uh, sorry, your Y axis indicating your tectonic setting and your Y axis, uh, your X axis is basically showing the contribution to the hazard. So you can see for other classes, subduction interest lab, subduction interface and active shadow class. In Bululo, there is the, the maximum contribution is coming from the active shadow class events. But actually there is quite a bit of contribution from the subduction interest labs. And if we, basically look into the details. We can also carry out to the, uh, carry out this aggregation based on the magnitude and distance and study which magnitude and distance uh, contributes most to the hazard. And here is just one example again for Bululo. So you can see the, the, the mode value for earthquake is the earthquake with a magnitude of 6.9 occurring at distance of 90 kilometer is uh, on average contributing most to the hazard, which is quite consistent uh, with what we had in 2019. 
And this is a geographical disaggregation. The, the, the height of the bars is actually showing the contribution of the different sources to the hazard in, the, in blue low. And you can, I think it's a bit hard to see, but the green point here shows the blue low and all those uh, sources that is coming up uh, from the disaggregation analysis indicates that the contributing sources are basically located at northwest of Pululo, which is again consistent with what we observed during that uh, 2019 earthquake. And uh, just uh, finally, we tried to do some uh, comparisons uh, with, uh, with the existing seismic zoning map of uh, Papua New Guinea. So just again, give you one example here, uh, which would be probably the most uh, important one, the, the uh, based on the seismic zoning map, the existing seismic zoning map of the Papua New Guinea building code at lay, the effective PGA that should be designed, uh, that should be used for design purposes would be 0.3G. But from uh, over 10% uh, in 50 years or 475 years written period uh, map, the PGA would be uh, like around 0.8G. So there is a significant huge difference and huge increase in the number. And uh, we, sh we just wanted to basically make sure that this uh, makes sense, at least uh, from whatever evidence that we have at the moment. So we carried out with the disaggregation of the lay just to see uh, which earthquake sources are actually contributing to this high hazard at lay. And in case of lay, you can see the, clearly that the main contributor to the hazard is actually coming from the active shallow cross sources. And if you look at the, the, the basically the geographical disaggregation, you can clearly, so this uh, red curve here shows the RMF, the Ramo Marham fault. And you can clearly see that the large earthquakes uh, that are happening on this RMF is actually contributing most to the hazard. So if we wanna get prepared, for example, for the future potential earthquake in late, this would be a good uh, sort of a scenario that we can uh, basically base our preparedness for. And I think uh, this, from what Phil also mentioned, this makes perfect sense um, because Lay is actually sitting right next to the RMF uh, zone and the Ramo Markham fault zone, as Phil mentioned, marks the collision uh, boundary between the South Bismarck plate and the, and the mainland PNG. And if you look at the history, there has been many moderate, uh, at least several moderate to large earthquakes on this particular fault system. And more importantly, all the GPS studies uh, for RMF actually indicate that the significant portions of this uh, fault system appear to be locked. Okay, so as the last application of the, uh, the developed hazard model, uh, I am going to hand over to Mark to talk about the building codes and how we can use this model in the building codes. Well, thank you very much, Hadi. I'm just going to try and uh, share my screen now. Yep, let me unshare mine. And sorry, Mark, it's gonna be pretty tight here because we've already got only about eight minutes left. Right, uh, let's just see how we go. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, okay, right. So how do we translate this new seismic hazard for design professionals? Uh, well, that's what I'm going to briefly talk about now. Um, and in doing that, I'd like to acknowledge, again, Andrew King, Rob Jury, and also Neil Corby uh, here at GA who've uh, helped in that process. Just, uh, I'm just trying to advance the slide at the moment. I can't seem. Okay, so when we think of building regulations, what are we trying to achieve? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to achieve a compatibility uh, with the hazard and, uh, and the vulnerability. So in doing that, we'd be then uh, limiting the impacts of natural hazards to levels acceptable to society. So in the terms of earthquake, limiting loss of life, limiting loss of amenity of buildings, limiting economic loss. So really, how effective are the PNG building regulations in doing that? Well, they were developed in the early 1980s. You see them here. Uh, they were an adaptation of the Australian standards by a New Zealand consultant. Uh, they covered uh, loadings, design methods, the materials that were available in the marketplace at the time. And quite remarkably, they're 40 years old and have had no amendment in all that time. So we're focusing on this 
uh, part four earthquake design actions. So Hadi's already showed you um, the currently used uh, hazard zonations based on 1970s science. What we have on the right there is the latest understanding and immediately we can see that there are differences and Phil has already talked about the Raman Markham fault. There's a high hazard region there that's not captured at all. So how does it look across the country? So first of all, we have to appreciate that the loadings on buildings is dependent on the natural period. So if you're looking at uh, short buildings, they might have a natural period of about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds through to the tallest buildings that we find in Papua New Guinea on the right there, which would have a natural period of maybe one and a half seconds. So what we've done is we've looked at all uh, these building periods, natural periods, looked at 27 communities, and what you see in the period, in the table here, sorry, are, and I'll just get a, a pointer so I can point to that. What you see across the top here are these natural periods of interest. We have the 27 communities here, and what the cells are colored is basically uh, the percentage to which uh, the current standards provide a design loading that's compatible with the latest understanding of hazard. Now, most buildings in Papua New Guinea are shorter uh, period structures that you see here. And what you can see, there's a lot of orange, which represents at least a 10% under design. What we also see uh, as blue, which represents an over design. And for example, for Daru, if it was a 0.5 second building, it would be designed for 10 times the loading that would be necessary as indicated by PSHA. 19. Looking at lay, uh, Hardy's mentioned lay. If we design a, a short structure in lay, uh, we're probably using uh, designing with half the load we should. Moresby is still under designed. And if we go to Milne Bay Province and Alatau, it's 29%. But that's assuming that we don't take into account the increased ductility demand for short period structures that are captured in design standards for plate boundary countries. And just to look at that same uh, table again, but now we're looking at that greater demand, the deficiencies are far greater. So for lay, we're designing for one fifth of the loading that we should. In Alatau, it would be one seventh. So really what's happening here is resources are not being used well. We're under designing in most instances, and there are other instances where we are over designing and wasting the limited resources of the country. So we engaged in a stakeholder process, uh, engaged with them, uh, including the reg or the uh, government agency responsible for the standards, uh, the regulators, uh, the professional groups that use standards or are involved in the building industry. Uh, we had uh, two principal workshops and uh, we also had a lot of engagement outside of those workshops. And from that, uh, we had a number of outcomes. One was a recognition that we really needed to update the whole suite of standards. That was fairly obvious that in ad adapting them, we'd want them to be consistent with those used in Australia and New Zealand. It would be a two-stage approach where we'd have an interim amendment that would address the under-design. That's what's about to be delivered in the coming week. Um, and then beyond that, there was a clear need to update all the standards. And if possible, to try and bring the design profession in PNG closer to best practice in other parts of the world. So we had a, a, a scope there, some of the elements, I won't go through them, but it was agreed just what we should incorporate into the standard. And, and then we looked at how we might then adapt PSHA. So one of the things we did was to see whether we could run with zones of uniform hazard, as in the uh, current standard. This is work done by Neil Corby. Uh, of course, this had to be uh, turned into boundaries that we could define geographically and our stakeholders reviewed that. Um, instead, they preferred a contoured approach, which we think was a good choice where we provide tabulated values for the main communities and contours so that you can use it for the design of buildings in other locations, bridges, substations and other infrastructure as well. We also use PSHA to uh, develop uh, factors for adjusting the hazard for longer and shorter return periods. Um, it's called a, uh, uh, basically a, a probability factor. Uh, what we found was that they were, for PNG, we've recommended that is very close to those in New Zealand, and we might expect that given the same seismotectonic setting. And also we had a look at the design spectra, uh, which basically give us the loading for buildings of different natural periods. So again, we looked at the same 27 communities. 
Uh, we looked at four seismotectonic settings, depending on whether the hazard was driven by local earthquakes or larger tectonic plate boundary earthquakes. And uh, what we found was that there was a distinction between those that were influenced by local hazard, uh, where, losing my pointer here, for short periods, the demands are greater um, and lower at longer periods, whereas for locations where tectonic plate boundary megathrust earthquakes are dominating, we get greater demands for longer periods. And that's what we would expect given the frequency content of the earthquakes that are driving the hazard. So for PNG and the interim amendment, we looked at the spectrum for uh, Australia, for New Zealand. We have the average here. Of course, we can't just use the average because we will be uh, underestimating about half the time. But we found that the uh, New Zealand spectra was a very good envelope for that. So we adopted that in the interim amendment and also uh, the uh, spectra in the New Zealand standard for two softer uh, site classes as well. And then finally, uh, we had to provide a design process so they can use this new information uh, and compare uh, what the loading would be using the latest, um, uh, the latest PSHA approach and what would be under the regulation, because the regulations govern, really. That is the minimum requirement. So this is the flow chart in the interim amendment of how you uh, go through it, which they're familiar with under the current regulations. This is the parallel process and uh, where uh, PSHA uh, gives a higher loading, then you would use that and avoid under design. And we've provided five uh, design examples to illustrate that process. What has been very positive about PNG is that there's been a very strong uptake uh, where already <clears throat> consultants within PNG and in Australia are using this uh, latest information uh, to undertake de design and also to assess the uh, uh, risk posed by assets that exist. So the Public Works Department, we provided guidance for an assessment of 129 bridges on the Highlands Highway. And also looking ahead, level two, where we uh, address uh, the full suite of standards, a full new uh, earthquake loading standard and, and a suite for other hazards and uh, how to design with materials alongside that. So there is a forward plan uh, subject to funding in the future. So let me quickly summarize the outcomes of uh, what we've listened to today. Um, the collaboration in producing this HA19 has greatly improved the understanding of earthquake hazard in PNG. And there are opportunities to improve it in the future and it should be a living assessment uh, a better network, a better GPS will all uh, support uh, that forward initiative. Uh, for standards for natural disaster, uh, natural hazards, they need to ensure that buildings are compatible with the hazard so that resources in a country are used effectively, they're not wasted, or resources are not used or deployed where they're required. And this approach it aligns with the new National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework uh, which is uh, endorsed by COAG in March and also the Sendai framework where we do not build new risk and what's more, we have the means of addressing uh, legacy risk. So in this case, PNG best practice in seismological science has been uh, used to advance this objective and alongside that has been uh, improved engineering design processes uh, which will be further advanced through a new standard but the interim amendment, which we hope is about to be published, um, it's going to avoid under design. Unfortunately, at this stage, we can't uh, take advantage of avoided over design because the current regulations govern. So we can think of this as a, a first step in addressing uh, legacy building regulation in PNG. And certainly the situation in, in PNG has highlighted the need to have living standards that are regularly updated that articulate best practice uh, hazard science and processes for design. And uh, just finally, we'd like to thank not only our partners that uh, featured at the start of the presentation, but a broader community of the stakeholders that have helped inform this project and also a broader community engagement. And what you see in the picture there is the Biala International School. And in 2019, a seismograph as part of PNG's community monitoring network was uh, commissioned 
And though we don't have the time, uh, the students there had a synchronized jump to subject it to its first strong ground motion. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Hardy and Phil. And we did go over over time a bit, and that's uh, I was I'll blame my introduction for being too long. Um, and I know there's probably um, there's at least one question, and I guess we're lucky with this kind of system of a webinar that we can probably capture that question. Um, which was from uh, Wayne Peck, who asked, uh, can you comment on your confidence around applying a single B value to all the shallow distributed seismicity? So Hardy, Phil, or Mark, if you're able to answer that one. Uh, I think I should take that one. Thank you. Not a problem. Yeah, so for that one, yes, I should say that we are pretty confident. And the reason is that we we didn't have time to show it, but we actually tested the, the variability of that B value or across the region by calculating it for different area source zones in the region. And the, the results, they were indicating that the B values from different parts of the region, they are not statistically different from the fixed number that we used. Thanks, Hardy. Yeah. And I don't think we've got any other questions. So, I mean, there's lots of good comments in there and, and thank you for a great presentation. I think it's a great piece of work um, to bring science and actually applying it to real outcomes. So I'll, um, unless there's any last questions, I can't see any coming up there. I'll thank everyone for attending the seminar today and thank our speakers. And just remind everyone that, um, I'll, as it was a seismic uh, a presentation, that the Great Shakeout is on the 15th of October. If you don't know what that is about, you know, get online and have a look. It's practicing your earthquake awareness, a very important thing um, to be across. Uh, and next week, we've got a presentation from Richard Lane and Phil, um, Phil Wine on um, the release of the 2019 Australian National Gravity Grids and new interface to the Australian Fundamental Gravity Network. So that should be a full on seminar as well. So thank you everyone um, for your time and it was a great presentation. Thank you, Hardy, Phil and Mark.